Andy Hammermeister is with the Organic Agriculture Center of Canada in Nova Scotia. He'll be talking about fertility management and establishing organic flat currents. Thank you very much, Chuck. And uh, I'll start off by acknowledging uh, Zirkle Fruit Company and thanking them for their sponsorship of the session. Um, this uh, research is actually a product of uh, my graduate student, who is David Hobson over here, and who's been doing the work on black currants. So um, I'm presenting largely his results. So black currants are uh, not very prominently grown in North America for reasons largely related to white pine blister rust. However, they are grown in other parts of the world and very uh, uh, prominent or very desirable in, in European countries and many parts of um, Asia. It uh, has a really strong, rich flavor and many health benefits. And we saw yes, or on, on Tuesday that uh, berries, organic berries, were uh, starting to top the list in terms of uh, prominence in the retail sector. And uh, those are blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries, if I remember correctly. And if we look at the health benefits of black currants, uh, in most cases, the black currants exceed those health benefits or the health benefits or nutritional benefits of those other berries. So we're seeing uh, some real uh, advantages to, to black currants and considering consumers in, organic, in the organic sector looking for nutrition and looking for health, um, if we can convince them to maybe eat something that's uh, really healthy for them, then we can move, we can help them. So the question is why grow black currants in Prince Edward Island? And uh, we do have an issue with white pine blister rust in, in the island, we've discovered. But um, the, it, it's kind of an interesting story because whenever we're talking about uh, developing a, a product uh, in, for the marketplace, uh, we should have an end target market in mind. And uh, for the black currant production, um, the, uh, the target market was Japan. And the, the reason why the target market was Japan was not only the health characteristics, and the Japanese are known to really go after the health characteristics of fruits, but uh, they are also a really big fan of Anne of Green Gables. And uh, if you, I don't know if you, many of you know, but Anne of Green Gables is a, kind of a storybook character out of uh, Prince Edward Island. And uh, the book has become required reading in school in Japan. And so every year uh, we have thousands of tourists that come to Japan or to Prince Edward Island and uh, from, from Japan. And uh, they're just enamored with uh, PEI and the whole concept of it. And uh, lots of volunteer uh, Japanese workers come to work on organic farms and PEI and so on. So, uh, so the, the idea here was to identify really healthy uh, fruits that they could market into Japan and, uh, and capture this this unique uh, Anne of Green Gables market. So, um, so the, it, one of the, the farms has, uh, that we'd worked with was Anne's PEI Farm, or that's the, the branding that they're, they're working with and trying to get into Japan. But the process, uh, growers have since then started to look more at uh, other markets and processing markets locally and, and uh, throughout Canada and the US as well. So a lot of the, the farmers on PEI, they weren't, aren't experienced fruit growers. And so when they decided that uh, there's this great market opportunity in Japan, a lot of them just uh, had some hay land in there uh, that they're kind of farming or living around. And they thought, well, hey, this sounds like a, a neat idea. So why don't we just throw in some black currants and wait four years and then we'll pick. And uh, they didn't really have any... Uh, do a whole lot in the way of soil preparation, and they just started planting their their bushes, and they weren't finding them that the bushes were were growing very well, and so one of the uh, the first things that we had done once we started getting involved with them on, in research was to to look at weed control, and uh, we had started off using a, a landscape fabric, and uh, and we very quickly saw oops uh, a really big difference in plants that were grown, planted the same time, same cultivar, everything. And the only difference was uh, uh, whether there was fabric beside them underneath the plants or, or no fabric. And absolute huge difference in terms of uh, the response in the plant just to that weed control. And when we measured the tissue nutrient concentrations, we also saw a very significant difference in the tissue nutrient concentrations of the plant, even though no amendment was added underneath the fabric. So you could see that that, uh, that weed control 
effect was uh, extremely important in, in those establishment years. So when you look at uh, uh, perennial plants, and, uh, and I'm actually grew up on a grain and beef farm out in Saskatchewan in the prairie region of Canada. And so uh, delving into the fruit area is, is relatively new to me. But um, when, so it's a very different management system, of course. And when we look at the nitrogen, the timing of nitrogen application into shrubs like this, um, nitrogen applied in the spring will go to the vegetative growth. Nitrogen applied post-harvest will tend to go to storage tissues in the roots. And uh, a lot of the spring growth comes from the storage tissue, but also some from the soil nitrogen. And a lot of the reproductive growth comes uh, from the stored nitrogen. So it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than dealing with the annual crops than, that I was dealing with. And you have to look at, a, at it from the long-term perspective. So that's uh, um, led to some of the research questions that I'll talk about shortly. Uh, another issue was that when you're harvesting black currants, there's, there's two different kinds of harvesters that the producers have purchased on PEI. Uh, this one's a, a modified soft fruit uh, harvester. And you can see the beaters here that would go back and forth and beat the, the berries off the bush. And this one here has some... Uh, um, some discs with fingers on them that just kind of shake and they'll shake the berries off. And, but in both cases, you'll see that the, the platform here it gets to be pretty much a, a foot off the ground. And so in order to be able to harvest the plants, you have to have a reasonable growth of the bush and like, get the berries up off the ground in order to catch them. <clears throat> so, um, so our goal here was to maximize bush growth and yield of the establishing plants. And usually we're targeting uh, the fourth year in terms where we should be in full production. And we wanted to identify the optimum timing and rate of amendments to achieve that. So our treatments here, uh, I'll describe the, the fertility treatments uh, fairly shortly, but we were applying them in the spring and or summer. So we had a split treatment as well as a spring and a summer treatment. And I'll, I'll go through the rates here in a moment. And we used the, the cultivar Titania. And uh, the results that I'll present are after three years, the third season. Or, and so we've had two harvests of the, the berries, but most of the data I'll show is just related to the second harvest in the third year. Uh, we measured variables like berry soluble solids, the bricks measurement and berry size and uh, uh, bush volume as well. We had two sites that we selected and uh, uh, this was ended up being a little bit more interesting than, than we had anticipated at first, as it ends up that one of the sites was much more fertile than the other one, not excessively fertile, but uh, the site management history just uh, was um, induced, uh, well, just had higher, higher fertility uh, status and uh, it had a big impact on the results, as you'll see shortly. So for fertility amendments, we used a mix of a, a pelletized poultry manure called NutriWave and crab meal. Uh, being in the maritime region, uh, crab meal is uh, a fairly um, uh, readily available source of uh, nutrients. It's around 8% total nitrogen, and the pelletized poultry manure is um, around 4%. Um, the availability of the nitrogen is about 75% in the crab meal and uh, uh, around 50%, uh, maybe even a little less in the poultry manure. And the reason why we used the blend was that the growers initially started putting in the crab meal to, with their plants, to uh, stimulate the growth, but they found that uh, raccoons and skunks were so attracted to the crab meal that they ended up pulling up the plants repeatedly. They, they ended up planting their thousands of plants re several times over because the, the raccoons and skunks kept pulling them out. And so uh, we ended up deciding to blend it with the poultry manure. And then we had, uh, uh, oops, no battery level. So then we had very low, uh, uh, we didn't have any trouble with the plants uh, being pulled out. Okay, so here are the fertility amendments. And uh, so we have a control where nothing was applied. SPR stands for spring. And we had three rates, low, medium, and high of the fertility levels. And then we had a summer treatment that was a high fertility level. Um, and then two split treatments, one that was a low, medium, and then a medium, low. So the low, medium means the low rate in the spring, and then the medium rate was applied in the summer. And, uh, oops, <laughs> lost it all. So um, so the rates of uh, nitrogen were actually fairly high. They ended up being in the order of uh, 267 or so 
uh, kilograms per hectare of total nitrogen that was applied to the, the, the crops at the highest rate. And uh, the medium and low rates went down from there. So it'd be a lot easier to show you, but maybe the bulb went. Well, the most important thing is that we had low, medium, and high rates of uh, amendment application. And uh, in the spring, we had a high rate in the summer. Then we had two split treatments. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, the measurements that we had conducted, we had uh, looked at we looked at bush growth uh, at three times during the growing season. Uh, but we, the data that I'll show you here in a moment only shows, we just looked at the cumulative growth of the bushes at the end of the, the, the three-year period. Uh, we also looked at uh, plant root simulator nitrogen levels, which is the ion exchange membrane that was mentioned by someone earlier this morning, and tissue nutrient levels. And if you want to get those results, you'll have to go to the Canadian Society of Hort Science meetings in Saskatoon, where David will actually be presenting uh, that, that data. So... Um, considering we lost a little bit of time here, I'm not going to go through this in, gen in a lot of detail, but uh, we focused on nitrogen because we're trying to get bush growth. And so that's why we were looking at uh, applying these rate amendments on the rate uh, basis of nitrogen. So we had 90, 176, and 267 kilograms per hectare of total nitrogen. And along with that came some phosphorus, potassium, and, uh, and calcium, and, and so on as well. And ends up uh, the phosphorus and potassium were more important than we anticipated at first. Um, so we'll just skip through this because uh, of limits in time. So uh, in terms of the bush volume, um, we have, again, there's the two sites here. The Farmington site over here, which is a site that had the higher fertility status. And then we had the Hunter River site, thank you, uh, that had the, the lower fertility status. The bush volume didn't have any significant effects here across all of these fertility treatments. And we had a pretty high, these treatments were being applied repeatedly and we didn't have uh, see a really significant effect except for um, maybe uh, you'd see a bit of a, an effect here in terms of the spring high treatment on vegetative growth. And over on the Hunter River site, we did see a significant response to the amendments. You can see the growth overall was a lot smaller uh, but as a result of uh, the amendment applications, we did see significant growth there. Now, if we look at the yield data, um, each of these are the, the yield data for 2010 and then 2011. So the second year is when we had uh, uh, you know, this much uh, more uh, higher yields. And you can see, again, the Hunter River site had much lower yields than the Farmington site. And again, exact same treatments and... Uh, cultivar and planting time and everything. So the only difference was the site effect. And you can see that there were significant uh, um, site or yield effects based on the treatments on that site. And uh, we are a little bit out of time here, so I'm going to skip through it in detail. But uh, the nutshell uh, was that uh, the spring medium rate seemed to promote the, the yield and the, the summer treatment and the, uh, the split treatment also seemed to do have promote yield uh, more than, um, than just the high spring treatments. So, oops. So in general, the nutrient effects, uh, the site with good fertility had very small differences in, I'm out of time. Uh, do I get a, a grace minute for the... <laughs> um, so the site with a good fertility had very small differences in growth and yield. And the site with the low tissue phosphorus and potassium that we measured uh, and low soil test levels had smaller berry size, lower growth, and lower yield. And the summer applied nitrogen uh, carried forward into the following spring and did affect reproductive growth as we anticipated. So timing your amendments of these sorts of amendments was ended up being really important if you're trying to promote vegetative versus um, reproductive growth. The split treatment we decided was uh, the best uh, in terms of growth and good yield, the, kind of the balance. So our conclusions to the, the farmers are that uh, 
um, we're, and we're exploring this in much more detail. We didn't see that much of a nitrogen response, but we think that phosphorus and potassium were, were likely limiting and we're, we're looking at uh, this this year. And um, uh, let's see, I think we covered most of the rest of it. So the background soil fertility is, uh, considering these farmers mostly just went into old hayland, um, they didn't really consider the background fertility. And that's something that we were seeing at some of these other sites uh, like Kyle's, where they did a lot of work in preparing the soil and building the soil health before getting into planting. And that's absolutely critical for the black currants as well. So I'd like to acknowledge the uh, PEI black currant growers and farmer cooperators that, uh, that helped out Karen Nelson, who is a research technician on this and uh, the PEI Department of Agriculture and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada uh, for their support. So if you have more questions or interest in tracking this, uh, you can go to our website, oacc.info. Uh, we also have a, a monthly internet a newsletter that we send out that you can sign up for free. So with that, there's a little bit of a whirlwind. Um, do we have time for questions or should we move on?